Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Baldessari. I'm the president of the Public Policy Institute of California. I welcome you to the Bechtel Conference Center for this important discussion about the future of education in California. I'm just really overwhelmed by the response um, to our event today. Little, little did we know when we, uh, when we uh, decided that we wanted to have an event on education that it would come about right around the beginning of the school year. And um, so there's definitely a kind of a back to school feeling about this crowd here today. Um, and uh, with the, the Labor Day weekend about to begin and the political season then starting after that, this is just really an opportune time for us to, to, uh, to get together. It's just wonderful. Um, this event is part of our uh, 2012 speaker series on California's future. For those of you who haven't been to our other events, uh, we've had quite a year already. Um, I'd like to thank this, the supporters and the sponsors of this series for underwriting uh, the support, uh, the Bechtel Foundation, the California Endowment, the James Irvine Foundation, the Pacific Life Foundation, the S Southern California Edison. The Stewart Foundation, of which Christy Pitchell is here today. Welcome, Christy. Um, Union Bank um, and our knowledge partner, McKinsey and & Company. And Lenny, Lenny Mendonca is here today, so thank you, Lenny, in person. Uh, we have a number of notable guests here. I'm glad that you had a chance to, to visit uh, during lunch. Hope that you have a chance to stay with us a little bit afterwards. But we've got um, lots, lots and lots uh, to cover in a short amount of time as always, um, with a wonderful panel here today. Uh, before we begin, two housekeeping issues. Um, you know, I'm, um, I'm the pollster for PPIC, so please fill out that survey that, uh, before you leave today. Um, very important for us to get your feedback, um, as always. And you'll probably be hearing from us during the election year as well, um, on the phone, though. But fill out your surveys. The other thing, which I'm going to do right now, is uh, to shut off your cell phones. Uh, see, uh, mine just went off. So um, please do that. Um, first thing we're, we're going to do today is we're going to hear from State Superintendent Tom Torlickson, who is going to discuss uh, his perspectives on the challenges and opportunities in education today. Following his remarks, um, we've got a great panel here today, the Fresno Unified Superintendent Mike Hansen, the Alameda County Superintendent of Schools, Sheila Jordan, and I will ask uh, them some questions. I've got a pocket full of questions. I'm sure I'm, I'm not going to get to all of them, but I will make sure that we have time to get to some of your questions because I know you've got a lot of questions and that's bringing you here today. So without further ado, uh, I'm pleased to introduce California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlickson, who has dedicated many years to public service. Before assuming this office in 2010, he served a combined total of five terms in the California State Assembly and Senate, 16 years on the Board of Supervisors of Contra Costa County, and one term on the Antioch City Council. So Tom, thank you for your public service. Fantastic. And I would be re remiss if I didn't mention that he started his career as a science teacher and a track and cross country coach. That latter part I always liked the most because you know that combination of knowing when to sprint and when you're doing a marathon, very important for a lot of us, so thank you. <laughs> uh, welcome, Superintendent. We look forward to hearing your remarks today. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, isn't it? Another fantastic day in California. Here we are in San Francisco. Here we are in the great state of California. And so. The future of education is now, and I wanted to share a few thoughts as we would lead into the discussion uh, to focus around what I call education optimism. But first again, thanks for the kind introduction, and Mark said this would be a high energy revved up group, and so I did my morning run along the Sacramento River, get my endorphins kicked in, and had about four cups of coffee, so trying to match what I see as a high energy and high interest here today. and so. I start, you know, next to um, the coffee and the running and being in great groups like this, the, the other thing that just gets me revved up and going is just visiting the classrooms in California and seeing students working, engaged, excited, uh, eager, seeing teachers that are skilled, that are passionate, that are imparting knowledge in, in a meaningful 
uh, way to help our kids build their dreams. And I want to, again, go to this optimism question. I, I take this survey everywhere I go. just want to see what this audience is like. PPIC is generally you know, sort of more on the, the upside, positive side. But, um, you know, one reason I'm an optimist is I am a teacher. Uh, and I ask this question everywhere I go, how many of you are optimists? We have different reasons, but overall, your perspective on life is you're an optimist. There, so there's a few that, a few hands went up slow, a few didn't go up. <laughs> Some people are thinking about it. It's okay. Uh, but, but fundamentally, I think uh, that's something we share in California, an optimism that we can provide a better life for this generation, the next generation, uh, that it will be better than our life, and we have some work to do to get there, but we have that fundamental belief. We're united in that belief. I think it's the center of the California dream, and of course, the key to the California dream working is education. Um, how many of us here carry photos of your kids, grandkids, nieces, or nephews? Hey. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's nearly universal. We have dreams and hopes for these youngsters in our lives. And we have a challenge in California to uh, have more people understand uh, the, the bigger aggregate hopes and dreams of the children of California. You know what percentage of the uh, voters in California do not have kids in our K-12 schools? Barbara knows. She's been at one or two of these before. Seventy percent. So that's a daunting challenge because not everybody, we have kids and nieces and nephews and grandkids, but we, we're not seeing some of the changes that have occurred in the schools. One of the other reasons I'm an optimist is Anthony. He's my uh, one and a half year, two and a half year old now, he's moving fast, two and a half year old grandson. And it constantly curious, endlessly inquisitive, you know, yearning for learning, uh, just, you know, eagerly exploring the world. And of course, my daughter and son-in-law have dreams for Anthony. Anthony will shape his own dreams. But I think this is, again, what unites us all in, in building these dreams and for the kids of California, helping them uh, meet their dreams and their parents' dreams. Now, how many of you have seen this before? Dreams, anticipation, some nervousness, and then somersaults and vaults, cartwheels and backflips spinning in the air, the constant search for balance, energy, confidence, inner strength, focus, again, helping our young people realize their dreams. How many of you have seen this recently on TV, watching from London? I mean, it, it, it's, the gymnastics were just incredible, the diving, the, the track events. But I think it's a testimony, again, to the human ability when you focus, when you believe, when you have supportive people around you. And what's going to happen in a few days, as Mark mentioned, we're starting the school year. And so teachers will be doing this incredible, valiant work that they do. Educators around the state will be welcoming kids in many districts. Mike Hansen's, they've already come back, right, a week, a week at it. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to all the teachers and educators. If you're a teacher or educator uh, by profession in some way or other or have been, please stand up and just let's thank all the educators in this room. Thank you. Thank you very much. So those of us who were classroom teachers can remember, and I'm a biology teacher, what it was like, that sort of anticipation of the first day of school. And I wanted to have the, the students be able to exercise that curiosity. We want to keep that natural exploration and wonder alive in our kids. And that's a key goal of what education should be about in, in California. So I got some scummy pond water, and there's all these microbes that are down there, Parmesium, amoebas, uh, cyclops, all kinds of fun, fun things down there that some you could observe with a magnifying glass, and some you need a microscope. So I had the scummy pond water, microscopes, magnifying glasses out, and I asked the students, I want you to write what you see and, and tell you what you think about it. What, what questions do you have? And then we got, uh, I took it out of the, the closet. I took the skeletons out of the closet. We had the, the snake, the, the, the rat, the, the frog, uh, the bird, the cat. Um, and then we had Dude. This is the rubber dummy that was in your classroom. Some of you remember <laughs> Dude with the, the plastic rubbery kind of organs. And so organs all over, and, and then Dudette was the uh, skeleton, uh, the, the uh, human skeleton. Anyway, it was the idea that we want to engage young people and have them express, communicate with each other, uh, learn good communication skills, learn good writing skills, observe the world and ask questions, ask you know, critical thinking, uh, is this alive? Is this a plant or an animal? If it doesn't have a brain, how could it be alive? Those kinds of, of questions. So we have all these aspirations. Uh, we have all this knowledge of what works. We have, at the same time, a huge crisis in confidence in public education in California. 
Uh, it's skepticism that goes over to cynicism in some cases. It, it comes from not knowing, and it comes from uh, reading and hearing you know, negative press around what's going on in the public schools. But again, when you visit these schools, and remind me to tell you later about solar suitcases, I just see kids that are doing things inspired, and a framework that we will probably have uh, a lot of discussion about in our, in our discussion group is 21st century learning, reaching and teaching the whole child. Uh, we have a blueprint. Any athlete, any champion uh, has goals, has plans, has a roadmap, how to get there step by step. Uh, a group of you in this room helped. Uh, we had 50 top people in the state thinking about uh, what are the programs that we should offer the students of California to have them succeed, to compete in the global economy, the strength of our economy, and, and to fulfill their, their self-potential. And so this is the Blueprint for Great Schools. It's on my CDE website. Um, and I just mentioned, and just these are things that we'll touch on in the discussion, but besides the whole child and 21st century, uh, we know the importance of preschool, and, and we know the need to invest in preschool to help close the achievement gap. We have education technology. Uh, Barbara Nemco is part of this team. We're looking to how to get the computer magic into the hands of every single student, not just every hour of the day, but after school weekends. Uh, we're calling it No Child Left Offline. Okay, No Child Left Offline. It's, it's, it's part of the magic that we can bring to our students and the skills they'll need to compete in jobs in the 21st century world economy. CTE, STEM, several of you are involved. Uh, Sheila uh, Jordan is part of our STEM task force. We want a renaissance there. We want a renaissance in the arts. There's so many things we know that are working. I look forward to your questions, Mark, and our, our debate. Uh, we know how to get there. We know through research. We know through track records of what has worked, how to help our students succeed. The financial issue is overriding at this point, so I, we, we're, we can't talk about education without looking at the choice, the historic choice in front of us this November. It's a debate that's long overdue. Uh, it's the first time we've really looked ourselves in the face. We hope we will look in the mirror and uh, as a people, as Californians, say we're ready to invest. We believe in our state. It's resilient, uh, but it's, its strength is its people. Its strength is its students. Its strength is the skills and dreams those students have. And so I am for Prop 30. I'm also for Prop 38. I'm for any revenue measure that's sensible that will bring dollars into the schools. And we can talk more about it, but schools have lost you know, 25 percent of their funding. The universities have lost that. Uh, we need to restore it. It's restoring, not taxing more than we've ever been taxed before. It is actually restoring dollars that were dropped out of the system over the last few years. Both measures are reinvesting rather than hiking taxes to new, new heights. It's an investment. It's the dreams of our kids. Thank you. Look forward to our dialogue. Fantastic. Well, um, Tom, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, joining us up here today, um, Mike Hansen, who is the superintendent from Fresno, um, Fresno Unified. And thank you very much, Sheila Jordan, who is the superintendent for the county of Alameda. And um, not by accident, we've got uh, both the state and local perspectives represented in, in this panel because um, K through 12 education in California is a, um, a unique, shall we say, combination of, of, of uh, work and interaction between the state and local level. And I thought that we would start um, our conversation today and um, maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start with Mike. <coughs> then Microphone's uh, on. Pardon? The microphone's on. Fantastic, good, <laughs> yeah. all right. Oh, so we'll yes. start with Mike, and then, then we'll hear from our other panelists in whatever order, Sheila and Tom, you, you want to uh, speak. But um, so if we think about what the state um, has to offer, uh, what can and should the state be doing to help local schools meet the future challenges of education in California? Mike? So thank you, Mark, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, with my fellow panel members. I, I think I will start answering that question with where Tom left off around just the finance piece. Ah. Um, I, I think uh, how the state can help us moving forward and as we look at the, the immense challenges in front of us, uh, we need to look at the resource question in three large categories. And I think the state plays varying roles in each. First is just the straight world of funding. 
So in the world of funding we get from the state, I think part A of funding from the state is greater flexibility we can get, the better off we'll be. Uh, I'll give you a quick example from Fresno Unified. We used to have in, in the world of adult school $13.6 million per year going into adult school. We now run, in my mind, a, a better, sharper program for five and a half million. And the balance of those dollars went into supporting students in K-12 and extended learning opportunities in the summer. So we went from 5,000 kids in summer school up to 17,000 by having the flexibility to move those dollars to higher priorities. So it's not that we don't think reminiscing is important uh, as an adult school uh, uh, class, but getting kids to graduate is much more important. So that flexibility is dramatically important. I think continuing to press on a smart weight, weighted pupil formula process is another critical piece that the state uh, can play a role. So that's just the pure funding part. Second part is uh, the world of uh, human capital. And I think we've got to do a great deal more. Uh, Tom can probably talk to this with his uh, panel of experts who are bringing forward uh, some great work around teacher effectiveness and teacher quality. Um, but we simply don't have the teaching force that we need to meet the needs of our kids across the state of California. It's borne out by our results. And in, in moments like this, we need to pause and say, what are we really turning out from the public schools in California? We are getting better, but we're not getting better fast enough for enough kids. And how we can impact that is through increased and better human capital coming into our system. And that, I think, is better partnerships with our local universities. I have to say, since we're in the Bechtel room, uh, that the Bechtel Foundation just funded Fresno and Fresno Unified and CSU Fresno to do an innovative new teacher credential program uh, in grades four through eight that focuses on science and math and English language ac acquisition and, and so on. So that things like that can happen and they do, they're just not done at scale yet. And I think another one that the state will have an impact on in the world of human capital, and we just need to think smartly about this, is we have uh, the opportunity as uh, Charlie Reed is the chancellor of CSU steps down into retirement, to think about that CSU chancellor as a driver of human capital development, like we haven't before. A lot of demands on that job that I wouldn't pretend to know about, faculty senates, the politics, funding, and all the rest of that. But when we have schools of ed in the CSU system that turn out one in 11 teachers nationally, we have to have from the chancellor's chair on down through the system, a unique view that the university is about human capital, in particular teacher development. Uh, and then the last piece that I will just say, uh, I think the state's role here is maybe muted, but in the third world of resources, I think we have to do more with less in our local context. And any way that the state can continue to incent or support local environments school districts working with county offices, working with universities, working with the mayor's office, working with county Department of Social Services and housing authorities and EOCs and all the rest. We simply have to get more creative than we've been. And uh, the $130 million I've cut out of my budget uh, for the kids of Fresno has been devastating, but muted a, a bit by the better partnerships we're building. Whoever wants to go next. I'll take it. <clears throat> so uh, I am Sheila Jordan, and I am from the, uh, and I see Richard Crisanza there, welcome, from um, San Francisco. So I, I uh, from the County Office of Ed, and um, how many of you have some idea of what the County Office of Education does? Oh, good. Uh, it's often a question. So Sheila, what actually do you really do? <laughs> Um, but, you know, we spend a lot of time um, working to coordinate, to build our regions, to, cre to create uh, effective structures. And I think something that we all believe is classroom first. But in order to have classroom first, you want to take some of the burden of some of the administrative coordination burden from the worry of the classroom teacher. <clears throat> so. In that context, I think it's really important as we look at, as the state looks at the issues of how to develop and build strong teachers as well as strong administrators, because I always like to say we, do, we uh, 
Teachers make the big difference for every child, but teachers can be most effective with strong principals and, and education leadership. So the training of principals, the inclusions of principals in policy development, and, um, and building their sense of autonomy and strength is something that we also spend a lot of time thinking about and working with. And we want the legislature to follow that. Uh, if you take a look at some of the initiatives on the ballot, it's only about classrooms. And you know, people take pride in saying no administration. But, um, and it's not a popular thing to say, oh, we want more administrators. And we don't want too many administrators. But we want good and effective ones uh, for our teachers to be able to prevail. Um, I think that this is a very challenging time. You all hear that. There are the upsides of us in education really working hard to build our partnerships, to have those partnerships be more effective, to make sure that we open the classroom doors, which historically it's many of the uh, the NGOs or the nonprofits, as well as um, foundations, have a hard time figuring out how to best serve kids who need to be served the most. And we have to get better uh, in the world of education to open our doors, to create those pathways, uh, pathways in and then pathways out, so that our kids can move into school and careers that are meaningful. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit directly to the issue of the state because uh, I've been speaking quite a bit lately about w the p within a very dismal funding and fiscal environment, uh, not just here in California, but nationally, internationally, um, there are some bright spots. And what keeps me going, you ask who's an optimist, what keep, you can't be in these jobs unless you have a, uh, an optimism and an energy for moving forward and for driving forward and for building those partnerships. And right now, we are in a very exciting time in education, and the state has a big role to play um, around the development of the Common Core curriculum. We have been for years now working on this narrow base that is based uh, that is tied to very high stakes testing. Uh, and we certainly have seen improvement in certain areas. We also are doing away with, in almost um, uh, a systematic way with some of the wonderful, with what children are born with, which is creativity, problem solving, curiosity. And when we take away the arts, when we take away an understanding of history, which has fallen off the, the map, when we take away civic engagement and building communities, we are doing a disservice to all of us because we're eliminating them building on an integra integrated curriculum, an interdisciplinary um, discipline where people can see the connections, where scientists who work with arts uh, and their imagination all the time um, are now being brought in back into the center is very, very critical. And um, an assessment is tied to that. <clears throat> it's a game changer now, guys. It really, we were involved in a game changer. The, state, the national folks have adopted Smarter Balance uh, and PARC, but in California we've taken on Smarter Balance as the new assessment system, which I think is the better one. And um, <laughs> thank you, Tom, for doing that. And uh, it is based on not just being able to regurgitate and mark down what the best answer is, you know, figure out what the best answer is. It's based on problem solving so that you're learning while you're taking the test. And it's a direct reflection of the curriculum that we are, are going to be teaching in Common Core. And for anybody in education, you all know that, <clears throat> you all know that uh, teachers have to teach what, they're going to be te what the students are going to be tested on. So that's why it's a game changer. And that's why it's very, very important that we have the resources to do it well. Because you can't ask teachers to make this kind of shift it's not a brand new idea, by the way. This is, you know, this is not something that was just invented. But we have a greater capacity to it today because of the work of our tech, because of technology, and because of the kinds of things that we can measure and use and, um, em and uh, employ technology to help us uh, be so we can be successful at doing this interdisciplinary work and being able to have. Um, a uh, assessment system that works. 
And I know my time is up, so I want to just end with the fact that children have to come to school ready to learn. And I think, you know, I applaud the governor and Tom and our leadership who identify that <clears throat> in order to do that, we, have to ha we need a balanced approach. If we do away with support for the underserved, if we, if we, um, if we do away with, some, with mental health and nutrition and working on the kinds of supports that families need to, be, to set, be able to send their children to school ready to learn, we are doing a disservice to education. And I, for one, it's not always popular among educators, I, but we, we need strong education program, but we cannot be successful with those children who are the greatest, who bring with, uh, bring with them some of the greatest challenges because of their life circumstances if we don't also work on those issues. And that's why I'm really glad and I thank you for allowing me to be here because you are a policy institute here. And I think that just as we integrate our disciplines, we have to integrate our policies. Tom, is there anything? Wholeheartedly else? agree. Wow, that was loud. Wholeheartedly <laughs> agree uh, <laughs> with uh, Mike and, and Sheila. And Mike was also on our transition committee. Sheila was helping advise uh, on that whole effort, a roadmap to success and great schools. I wanted to build a little bit on the Common Core because what you said as the target becomes the focus of administration of dollars channeled to, to you know, meet the target that's been set. And so what's good about the Common Core Standard and the new uh, Smarter Balance Assessment is that it is deeper, richer. Um, I, I looked at it and I said, do I want to be parked with the park approach or do I want to be smarter with the smarter <laughs> approach? I, no, no question. I said, let's be, let's be smarter. Uh, but it, truly, this is a revolutionary, major game changer for California. So setting those targets and finding ways to do, you know, measure critical thinking and, and writing samples and projects and how to blend it in and not just focus on very important math and English language arts, critical, but not just focus on them. We also have a distinguished schools program. I'm reaching out to superintendents and school boards around the state. The distinguished schools have been mostly based on your API, your actual test scores. Well, what if we included how well you're doing implementing technology and learning, how well you're doing in keeping dropouts from dropping out and graduating, how well you're doing with the arts, how well you're doing on career technical education. So blending some of these things so what the, we set a different target, then we'll have different energy and dollars flowing to the target. The other thing I would mention is the state runs, my department runs preschools, quality childcare, engaging the parents early. And what we're in the process of doing is developing yes. some information, um, you know, materials, uh, ways that when the moms and dads come in with their youngsters, with all those hopes and dreams, that we're helping them be the best parents they can be. Turning off the TV, trying to find a place. Some, it's, you know, some families, it's three families in a 600 square foot, 700 square foot apartment. So it's hard to find a quiet place. But getting sleep, you know, reading, role model reading, uh, good nutrition for brain development and energy and, and all these things we can start helping our parents grasp more of their responsibility. And then when you get to kindergarten, we have chronic absenteeism. You know, in Oakland and in parts of Los Angeles, a couple of different urban areas we looked at, chronic absenteeism, meaning you're absent 10% or more of the time, is 14% in Oakland and it's about 19% in parts of Los Angeles. That means by the time a youngster gets, you can have the best teachers, the best equipment, the best classes, but if they're not there, by the time they're in eighth grade, they've lost a whole year of schooling. And when they get to third grade, when they're supposed to read for science and social studies, not just for stories, uh, they're frustrated because they're behind and they get disheartened and those are your future dropouts. So the state can do more in terms of providing some overall, and then with best practices, what's working for Mike and Fresno, what's working for your districts, we should share, and, and with the digital age, we can easily share online these best practices and best methodologies. By the way, on the technology side, again, I think it's magical, uh, the power of that, and that we should, we're gonna come out with a really solid report setting benchmarks to really move California in that direction. I'm also starting a national movement through these chiefs of schools for um, the various states, the 50 states, on E-rate 
that's a funding source for access. We need more E-rate. We need it in our schools, in our libraries. We need more broadband. We need more uh, access and equipment. I'm also pushing for a $10 billion school construction bond. When you see these local school bonds and state school bonds matching their money, we, did, we raised, this report just came out from the Center for Cities and Schools, we raised $118 billion in the last 12 years. $66 billion came from local voter approved, but the state set up a matching program. We, we had four elections that put out $35 billion. You can equip the new classrooms that are built, the, the modernized, rehabilitated classrooms with all the computers and whiteboards, with the desk chairs. Uh, so there's some really big role the state has to play in, in this particular regard. We can also do group purchasing. We can help put together consortia of districts by region or statewide where we go to the internet connecting companies and say, we would like this product, what's your best bid? And so that's another thing I think uh, a role the state could very well play. Uh, looking at the achievement gap, of course, chronic absenteeism and underprepared for kindergarten, those are key factors. Summer learning loss, I, I won't go into details, but most of you know the phenomenon. We need to get summer school back, particularly lower income kids, kids at higher risk. They don't get the nutrition during the summer break and they don't get the, you know, the field trips and camps that other kids get and they lose two months of their previous nine months of learning. And finally, I'll come back again and again to this, the money. And so we have an historic chance and we can be the state. We are the state, we're the people that we need to work with every one of our friends and our church circles, our service clubs, our work sites to at family barbecues, bring up politics, bring up taxes. But right, that'll be fun. <laughs> but what the, you know, if we don't do it there, what, if not now, when? When and are we going to do it? And the importance of voting. Uh, yeah, everybody's going to go vote. And I'm, I'm saying vote yes on both because the narrow, there's a slim margin of Californians that are willing to vote yes. And I've looked at some polling data maybe around 55, 56%, but if there's a split in the yes vote, we could have two measures getting 48%. And yes, yes is sort of an insurance policy that if they can both get across the line, great. You're not double taxed, you only pay the taxes for the one that had the most votes. Uh, but it's truly an opportunity, a historic one, to invest. Thank you, Tom. I wanna to come back to a comment that Mike made um, earlier on and see if you two agree with him. Mike said that he was in, uh, favor of the weighted student formula. True? Yes. yes. Uh, do the two of you feel the same way? And um, uh, I'm wondering if there's agreement that that's the way forward and there isn't disagreement about it, uh, why aren't we doing that? Well, what should I? Go, go right at it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the more controversial issues here, uh, absolutely. And I was talking to Derry earlier about this because his foundation is working on it. Um, so uh, the Associate Superintendent of Business at Alameda County is, provide, is providing leadership around Damon Smith, around taking uh, at the behest of county soups who have lots of issues around the way uh, it, the weighted student formula was originally formulated. Uh, again, we don't want to do- Are you for or against it, first of all? Well, I'm for it. I'm for the, the concept of it. Okay. If it is thought out, in a more comprehensive right. way. Right. And I think there is a lot of agreement that, you know, the governor put it out there. It's, as always, you know, Jerry Brown's got lots of um, creative ideas. Uh, and this is a creative idea, and it is a way of attempting to ensure that underserved populations are served based on the numbers. But, you know, the devil is in the detail. And the good news about this is that it's not an initiative that you have to pass and, you know, take it or leave it. It is coming through legislation, right? It's coming through legislation, which is a better way for uh, us to be doing business overall, I think, because you have a chance to really think out what the details are. And, and uh, so I'm appreciative that there are now these working groups trying to make it work for everybody in a way that best benefits um, our, high, our most high need, our immigrant population, our homeless population, um, like that. Yes, with qualifications, and we have such an unfair system. It's, it's so unintelligible, it's, you just can't make any sense of it. You have districts in the valley uh, that I visit in your area, right. Mike, that they're, they're getting $5,000 you know, $5,500 per student. We have other districts getting $13,000, $14,000 per student. So the current system's broken, it's not fair, it's not equitable, I think it's a civil rights issue. I think eventually that'll go to court and that will be, you know, if we can't solve it as the legislature, 
we the people working with the legislature, uh, something's going to give on that and, and we're going to have to see the equity uh, in force. I think we should do it willingly and voluntarily. What, what's been the problem of any proposal and the governor's coming out of the box, I commend his boldness for bringing the issue forward uh, because it takes more to educate a student who's an English learner, more to educate a student from poverty. I mean, the poverty is overwhelmingly an influence on, on how students learn and it takes more to get that student up to speed. It takes more of the summer school programs, takes more of the chronic absenteeism prevention programs, et cetera. So one of the ways to go about it is you gotta create an expanding pie. You can't take away from districts that already have invested. They've already cut and cut. They have their arts program on the line to maybe cut that next. Uh, you, you can't do that. In fact, as I travel the state, I have school board members and superintendents show me, we'll vote yes for the, ta for the tax measure, but we'll end up with less money if the weighted student formula goes through. And why would we want to vote for a tax and go to our people and say, let's vote for a tax if we're going to get less money? It doesn't compute. So I think we need to work it out. It needs to be phased in. It needs to be done with the growing pie, not taking slices out of someone else's pie. Okay. And, and I'll just That's um, a really to important point. be contrarian, I think, to both. Uh, we're all supportive, but I'm more supportive of what the governor originally came out with. I, I'm one of those districts with 84, 85% poverty, um, high percentage of English learners and whatnot. His original proposal would have had us uh, benefit in the neighborhood of $17 million, right out of the gate, for the most part, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. By the time we, we call out the fact that there are winners and losers, and we start to modulate around that and bring it back to a center, now, as the fourth biggest district in the state with 73,000 students, the benefit to our district would be $3 million. I don't sniff at $3 million. $3 million is $3 million. But I think what we end up doing in the legislative process sometimes is we, we take something. So I'll just start by saying this. Um, there are winners and losers right now. There are winners and losers right now called the kids who are not making it. And... Uh, and certain systems aren't making it. And, and I'm, I, I, we need to start with that. I think part of our problem around weighted uh, pupil formula is that we didn't back up, even when I was talking about my first three resource pieces, they're not all under the header of investment. We don't truly talk about our dollars, our human capital, and our, our funding formulas as investments. We talk about it as money, whose ox is gonna get gored, how do, how do things flow and whatnot. And we continue to uh, talk about uh, how big the pie is and try to get more. And that's helpful to a degree, but it's not going to solve the problem. We have to shift into uh, getting California to understand that we have to invest in children if we're truly going to get the benefits that we want from our public schools and ultimately our society. I mean, this stuns me, frankly, that we are the ninth biggest economy on the planet and we're absent in the world of presidential politics. I get, I get it. I mean, we're, when you tilt one side uh, too much one way or the other, both parties don't need to come to your state except to fundraise, right? The party that doesn't think they're gonna win doesn't bother. The party that thinks you're in the bag doesn't come. So we're, we're irrelevant with 38 million people. It, it drives me bonkers, right? We should, we're a driver of the American economy and we're not, we're not forward, uh, on that, on, that, uh, um, on that platform. But if we were, we could be talking much more clearly about investing in children as a way to move forward. And then I totally agree with Tom when he says the early childhood stuff is critical. Fresno County, for example, we, we're not at 8.3% unemployment as the nation is, or 10 something like the state is. We're, we're darn near double that. We're like in the 15% as a county, unemployment. In preschool, we've got 42% of our kids in preschool. That's a pretty tough set of circumstances trying to, and, and it's also one of those counties that's in the top 20 nationally with the housing crisis. Right? You start to buckle those down on families and kids and it becomes very difficult to pull them out of that. And so that's why I get frustrated when a weighted, a weighted pupil formula that could have offered some help, we pay great attention to outliers and instead of fixing the outlier, or trying to pull the outlier in, we squeeze everything in so that it becomes more plain vanilla. And then we're right back to winners and losers and maybe we're just tolerating different winners and losers and we really don't get to a solution 
that might be moved forward. I'm not sitting here saying I've got a better way to do it or a perfect way I've worked out on the back of an envelope. But I do need to point out that we have tough, tough choices to make. And it's not just in November about do we say yes or no. It's about are we truly going to invest in the kids that we have in this state? And I would say if we don't, if we don't, within five to ten years, America is going to look a heck of a lot more like California, economically and otherwise, than California will look like the rest of America. Um, let, let me follow up on a, a, a term that I, I heard in both of your um, discussions, and that was the term English learners, and uh, which is a very large and very important group of students um, in our K through 12 schools today. What should we be doing to improve the performance of English learners that we're not currently doing as we talk about making investments? We, go ahead. I, I'd like to hear from in, each of you on this. It's in the Department of Education, we found English learner programs were siloed into four or five silos. We've combined them, so we've brought in new staff, new focus. As, that's a good starting point. Uh, it's imperative we have every youngster in California master the English language as soon as they can. And yet at the same time, we can see another language as not a problem, but as an opportunity. And the seal of biliteracy, which many of you in this room supported, the idea of we should honor students who are bilingual, trilingual, when they graduate and have that special seal. And 10,000 students came through this June and, and got the seal of uh, biliteracy. So we, we, we need to do more of that and, and promote that. Fundamentally, early learning again, you know, getting the kids early, uh, having the idea that every home should have some reading materials and parents should role model. This is part of what's needed. And if you don't speak English, read La Pignon and, and show your kids that reading's important. Um, again, some of the computer technology, because some of it costs money. Um, but Imagine Learning is just one program. It's being used on uh, Otay Mesa, right on the border with uh, Mexico. And, and, San Diego area, Is it's powerful. Program? Any other districts here you're using it, Richard? It's, it's powerful. It's just, it gets the kids right where they're at and builds their skills just methodically. Classrooms that are you know, 22 that are now 38, it's a lot harder to reach those kids yeah. and their parents. So part of it, again, is the bigger funding issue. Part of it's a keen focus, because a quarter of our kids are English learners, I think soon to be a it's third. A, it's a very large We're group. heading that way. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'll just, I think Tom is, is right on those points he raises, but I'm, I'm going to add to it by saying in California, we have the cultural issues uh, that we are not talking about publicly or very artfully at all. And they go to issue of race and ethnicity. We just simply, we run up against that repeatedly. Um, we have uh, a, a number of folks, well, you look at the leadership of, heck, the core districts that I work with, Outside of Richard, we're all white guys. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a white woman in one district, right? And we're leading districts with like a million, million plus kids. And 900,000 of them are kids of color. Look at the mayor's chairs. Look at all the chairs that matter. We, we, we haven't done enough. We've given lip service to capacity building for communities of color, but we haven't delivered yet. And I think that matters. And I think that we get wrapped up in a lot of uh, political and social issues that are not really tied right to the language. Um, I had the unique and humble opportunity last week uh, to be in Finland with the United States delegation and Christy Pitchell and some others were there. It was jaw-dropping to see these kids. Where are Sixth grade in Finland. Yeah. Sixth grade, seventh grade. It didn't matter which kid you talked to. You'd have to keep a list of which languages they knew, right? It would finish We're famous for this right off the, off the top. English, those two were givens. And then it varied, depending on what the kids wanted to take. But they all knew three, four. I had a kid say to me, pointed to another kid, that kid, right, sixth grade, seventh grade, that kid only knows three languages right now. I'm not sure they're going to make it. <laughs> right? Are you kidding? Right? It, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely crazy the level of language proficiency kids had in other parts of the world, and it was just expected. And, and we don't do that. And when you ask the Finnish kids, how did you learn English so quickly, so well? What did they say? Cartoon Network. 
or they said online gaming. Wherever there was a subtitle or they were pushed into something they wanted to do that was in English, that's where they learned it, right? So I, I think there's a lot that we could be doing that is not necessarily in the classroom, uh, but, but uh, I think there's a lot more we can be doing. Fresno Unified's done our English Learner Task Force and we're implementing those things. But I think it also goes back to how teachers are trained in our state, back to human capital and the investment we have to make. We have to look at our, for example, our Spanish speaking kids, that is California, period, right? There's no discussion about that. And every day we waste not moving heaven and earth to get those kids bilingual and, and literate and doing math at a high level. We are uh, slowly but surely burying ourselves part by part by part, day by day. So. I think it's going to take a much bigger societal conversation before we really get where we need to be. Um, Sheila, a brief comment, and then I want to turn to the audience for some questions. Sure. Just briefly, because I think um, my two colleagues here did a great job. But I want to tip my hat to Richard Carranza and what's going on in San Francisco. I th because uh, we talk, you talk about early childhood development, and obviously the early you start working with uh, English language learners, wherever they're from, the quicker they're going to pick it up because kids are sponges and if it's available to them. But when youngsters are coming to us and they do come to us regularly at, at uh, older ages, uh, some of the newcomer programs make a huge difference because one of the things that happens is we take these students, we put them into um, a classrooms, and depending on the age level, we keep them stupid, so to speak, because they're not, you know, it's so hard for them to assimilate all the content area. Whereas if they're being taught in their home language and then moved into the regular schools in the afternoon for, to, to uh, be able to interact with everybody else, then they move in smarter because they've got the content language and they don't reach uh, graduation time and they may have basic English down, but they've missed so much of the content. and. Uh, I, I think it, it, these are complex issues, and certainly the culture, American culture is very parochial. We all know that. Anybody who, you know, whatever country in the world, they're better than we are in terms of the understanding of the importance of multiple languages and, and having kids automatically start thinking in those terms. But we do have to work with what we got, and we do need to take a look at best practice and how to use technology and... It has to go back to adequate funding. It, we can't do it without adequate funding and ongoing professional development for our teachers and our principals in the school sites let's because take, that's it. Sheila, Thanks. let's take a few questions. Let me, ask, oh, let me ask you a very simple question, Tom. Um, training and, and converting to Common Core is a huge job. Uh, it's going to mean retraining lots of teachers. Um, to what extent, what is the state doing? What resources, what expertise is the state providing uh, to help retrain those teachers? We've dedicated a key element of our staff team to this effort. Uh, we've gone to foundations who've been so generous to fund a joint position that is in the Department of Education and also with Mike Kirst and the State Board of Education. So Mike, as you know, is the president of the State Board of Education. So we have a collaborative effort going on. Uh, we have on our um, we have a special website access point for sharing. We're again already getting best practices in terms of professional development models that are working in different subject areas and different grade levels uh, to share those. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Other states are you know innovating. They have the same common cores. So why not learn from each other and not reinvent the wheel? So those are some of the efforts. It is enormous. The county offices we have you know several here. Sheila. Uh, you know, Barbara, Nemco, the county offices of education are doing their role. There's regional seminars, our staffs around the state uh, putting on seminars. I'm hearing excitement from teachers about the Common Core and then also a little nervousness as they start to see what the depth of the questions and the interlinking of different subject matters. But I think generally it's, it's been stimulating and well received, uh, but there's a long way to go to actually get it fully implemented. No, but we, we're, we've offered, we've gone to the publishers and the state board and myself have put out a request for bridge materials so we can bridge from what we currently have, our current curriculum, uh, to the deeper, you know, types of questions, types of critical thinking that are in the Common Core. 
So there's a process going on. I mean, we've we've flexed, as as Mike said, as district school boards. Jill's here to win from San Francisco and from the school boards association. They've they've cut and and cut and flexed meant they did away with the textbooks too. Uh, some of those purchases, but there's a open source in some respects, and there's also again this digital world that. Uh, won't necessarily be a lot less expensive, but it is a way to go for getting that curriculum in the hands of our students. Let's take another question. It took only almost an hour for school boards to be mentioned here. <laughs> so, uh, and I also, Sheila, want to say to you, as proud as I am of my superintendent, the services that we are providing and the policies that we have in San Francisco reflect our community's values through the democratic process by electing the Board of Education. So what we are doing here... I didn't mean here, to leave you guys I, out. I, I'm, I'm not I'm being, I, don't, I have no right. personal defensiveness <laughs> about this. I'm telling you that that's one of the problems that we have, is that we are not leveraging our democratic opportunities. And if we want people, as we do, to vote to support schools this November, and we want them to always do that, we have to continue to tell them why this process, why American public education is the core of our democracy, and why they have to exercise their right to govern their schools, and, and why this is a uniquely democratic process in America. It is not only a professional activity. The professionals are essential, but our belief in what is important about public education is so core to our democracy that we need to, you know, kind of stand up for it, I think, a little more. That's my job. I'm the president of CSBA, but it's more important to our communities. You, San Francisco is a great example. This community that has, city that has the smallest percentage of school, of uh, ch children under 18 of any in the nation, and yet has never failed to pass a school funding measure. Well, thank you. I, I didn't see a question in there, but uh, is there a response? How about that? Oh, I think maybe you want to hear from other people okay. first. A, a question, please. It, oh, it's a question. Good. I'll hold it. But Thanks. thank you for your, your comment. I, Th this is a question important. for Tom. Of Right now, a lot of us who are in the advocacy world are just losing sleep about AB5, the teacher evaluation okay, uh, legislation. Okay. Um, it, it has been done behind closed doors. There was a third set of amendments yesterday. The advocates have no idea what's in it. The question is really, is, is someone like you who actually will be responsible for implementing it, this is a horrendous way to make public policy. Would you be willing to publicly come out and say, let's stop? I mean, like Sheila said, we've taken time to do the Wade Student Formula. We'll be deliberative about it. Let's have a task force. But the fact that all this is going behind closed doors and none of the advocates know what's in it, and it's 24 hours away from being passed, would you publicly come out and say, let's stop and reconsider in the next session, where we can do it out in the open? I'm not ready to say that, but I, I'm saying we, we must grapple with these issues. And sometimes the legislature has its ways, and sometimes the last minute is the, the way that big things get done. I believe from what you know, my staff's monitoring this hourly, uh, by the minutes I've been in touch with other superintendents, we've taken amendments, taken ideas, brought them to the committee to shape the bill. Uh, the issue of teacher excellence and teacher valuation is key. Uh, we still have some chance of getting the waiver on No Child Left Behind. And we've had feedback from the U.S. Department of Education that the AB5 is a good framework, quote unquote, good framework from a source that we're working with, a, a person we're working with. And so we have an opportunity. Um, you know. Somebody may disagree with the process. It's, there you know, have been hearings on the topic. It's not totally you know, behind closed doors. Uh, but I believe the end product could be very helpful. It's only a piece, by the way, of what, what's going to come out from a task force that Chris Steinhauser and Linda Darling Hammond have put together uh, through my offices, a committee looking at educator excellence from the beginning of recruitment to the teaching profession, induction, mentoring, is she supporting uh, AB5? Yes, Linda Darling Hammond is supporting it and believes it's in keeping with uh, good practice and good research. Okay. Um, one but more just question to be fair right on here. that, okay. I, can't, I can't let that go. To be fair, Chris isn't. Okay. Chris, Chris Steinhauser, the other half of that, isn't supporting AB5, and, and right. many Thank of us wouldn't. I don't want to get into the debate. One more question, and then we're going to have to. Um, so we're out of time. 
back on. How about the question right. first? Because um, we, we're really over time. Real quick. So okay. from my understanding, um, before the governor moved forward with student for, uh, funding, there was already um, a bill in that was in process, AB 18, um, that from my understanding, again, didn't actually have a game of winners and losers. It was being phased in and it was about building the pie. And so my direct question to Sheila and to Tom is if you are in support of this as an effective strategy with a growing pie in the state of California, what are you going to do to actively make it happen? I have been a sponsor working with Julia Bromley. I think you're referring to her bill. Uh, I think it, it is a doable, workable approach with more phase in. Uh, she's termed out going on to Congress, I believe, uh, if the election goes her way. Uh, but I am very determined. I mean, it's so blatantly unfair. Again, it's a civil rights issue. It's an equity issue. It's leaving behind so many kids that, that deserve to have the help. Uh, so I'm going to keep working to create the coalition and the, and the thinking of how to, how to make this a fair process. Uh, and if the ballot measures pass, we have so much more of an opportunity because it'll stabilize the, the funding for K-12 schools in, in Prop 30's case, and it may even add a little bit more money for K-12 schools in Prop 38's case. And, and some of that can be used to differentially uh, deal with the inequities uh, without you know, going anybody's ox that's currently trying to you know, provide services in their existing district. You know, I think the importance of an expanded pie is critical. You know, back when we fought for the civil rights, for the women's movement, if you create equity based on the lowest common denominator, you're in trouble. Uh, and so what we want to do is not have uh, great winners and great losers, but to try and come up with, a, a, with something that really reinforces the best that we have to offer. And, uh, and a commitment to social justice and equity uh, as, as its core. Well, uh, Mike, did you want to have to the final one? Okay. So uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. And for those of you who are sitting there with questions that are unanswered, think about me. I've got like all these questions <laughs> that I wanted to ask. Mark. <laughs> and um, I'm going to have to, um, like you, hope that during the conversation after this today, we have a chance to to, uh, to address those. Um, and uh, first, I want to thank this tremendous panel and our great speaker today for, for taking their time to be here. And for all of you for taking your time during uh, the lunch hour and making a long lunch today. Uh, I'm very mindful of the fact uh, the, of, of the clock um, during lunchtime uh, because you all have to go back to work. Um, so uh, thank you. But for those of you who can stay around uh, for a little bit, you know, uh, you're welcome to, to be here, talk amongst yourselves, talk with our panelists who can stay here. Um, obviously, these are hugely important issues. And, and members of my survey team are holding up the survey saying, please fill out the survey. Um, I want to thank again the sponsors for making this possible. Um, you know, we, we've heard some very important issues today. I want to reinforce what we heard from one of the members of our audience that, you know, civic participation, the people getting involved in these issues, hugely important. Um, and and uh, there are issues on the ballot uh, locally and statewide. Um, but, but there are issues just, um, you know, at, at, our, at our local uh, school board meetings uh, every, every week that we need to address. And thanks to all of you for your public service and the work that you're doing uh, in the panel. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome.